At the end of each row, you will find uh, a friendship pad. If you would take that and fill out the information requested, then pass it back down to your queue, and we'll be able to see the names of those with whom you are worshiping today. By order of the session, the annual meeting of the Congregation and Corporation of the First Presbyterian Church of Washington, North Carolina, will be held this morning, January 29th, immediately following our service of worship. A meal, free and open to all, will be held in the fellowship hall following the conclusion of the meeting. We hope that if you are a guest, that you will plan and stay and eat lunch with us today. Our elder on call this week is Eleanor Rawlings. I think probably most of you are old enough to remember the routine. Who's on first? Yeah. Well, get ready, because I'm about to do a retake. Our fellowship dinner, which is normally held on the first Wednesday of every month, will not be held on the first Wednesday of February. Instead, it's going to be held on the last Tuesday of February, and the fellowship dinner that would normally be held on the first Wednesday of March will not be held because we had dinner on the Tuesday on the last Tuesday of February. <laughs> Did you get that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Basically, our fellowship dinner this coming Wednesday will not take place because we're having lunch together today. So come and eat lunch with us today, but don't come on Wednesday. <laughs> and then at the end of the month, the last Tuesday, in February is Shrove Tuesday. We're going to have a Mardi Gras hang cake supper prepared by some of the men in the church. So plan on coming to that. Bring a friend. It's going to be lots of fun. They tell me beads and masks and all sorts of Mardi Gras stuff. So plan on coming to that. It will be lots of fun. Then on Wednesday, which is the first Wednesday in March, March the 1st, will be our Ash Wednesday service. So we won't have a meal in March because we've just had one at the end of February. Is everybody clear? These dates will be posted in our bulletin um, next week so that you can uh, keep track of everything. But we hope that you will take note and make sure that you participate in all of these fellowship events. Now, let's prepare our hearts to worship Almighty oh, God. Worthy, 
O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to you, and we have come to praise your name.
everybody have breakfast this morning? Yes. And what'd you have for breakfast? Okay. All right. Peanut butter? Anything else? Does anybody know what this is? Flour. Flour. What's this used for? Bread. Bread? Cake? That's right. Cookies? And uh, what's this? Are these ever used together? Yes. To do what? What do you make with these? Cookies? Cake? Have any of you made uh, cookies before? Yes. Yeah? Cornbread? And did it turn out well? <laughs> well, when you made some cookies or made some cake or made some cornbread, I bet you didn't just throw it all in, just random this, random that. You had a recipe, didn't you? Yeah? And if you followed that recipe, the result was tasty, right? And I bet they were pretty sweet, weren't they? Yes. That's right, because of the sugar. What else is sweet that we can make from these things? <coughs> we can make cakes. Banana bread. Banana bread, there we go. Zucchini bread, anybody ever had zucchini bread? It's actually pretty tasty. It doesn't sound good, but it's great. Well, those are all very sweet. And it all come from a wonderful recipe. God has something even sweeter that comes from a recipe as well. Honey? God has a recipe for our happiness, our salvation. Because God has given us His Son, Jesus. And it's through Jesus, this recipe that God gave us, through Jesus, if we ask for forgiveness, if we turn our hearts over to Him, that we receive love. That's correct. And so by giving Him our hearts, our souls. <laughs> yes, we take out our heart. Not literally, of course. This is not a pagan religion. There's no sacrifices going on here anymore. By following God's recipe, He has promised to love us. By loving Jesus, we receive God's love as well. Does anybody feel like that is a pretty good recipe? It's a pretty easy recipe to follow too, isn't it? Do you think that's something that you might be able to make every morning when you get up in addition to your breakfast? Oh, that's a good question. I bet God knows the answer to that. Yeah, a ball of light. A ball of light. Let us pray. Now let us ask God for the reminder of His recipe. Lord God, please be with us as we go through each day. Remind us what your word is. Remind us of your love. Teach us every day through all of our actions, all of the challenges that we face. Teach us that your recipe is a recipe for good. A sweet recipe of love that you have blessed us with through your son, Jesus Christ. And let us consume that and eat that and embrace that sweet recipe every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
sisters in Christ, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Well, my son did the children's sermon, and I'm tempted to stand here and say uh, what he said. Amen. And go sit down. <laughs> A lot of you be happy about that. It would probably be shorter than what I'm going to do. But in any case, uh, today, if you would, I'd invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel. And I want you to take out your few Bibles, your personal ones. And you'll see in there that the message, the scripture that I'm reading is truncated. I'm beginning in the first chapter, and then I'm jumping after the first four verses into the fourth chapter. There we pick up verse 14. So it's one thumb in uh, chapter 1. One index finger in chapter 4, so you can flip with me. If you look that up, I'll take you, give you a moment to do that. And we're going to be listening to God's word as we find it here this day. Listen out to God's word. Since many have undertaken to set down an, an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. And when Jesus went to the synagogue, this is what happened. And Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. And he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. And when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Wondrous God of grace and of love, we give you thanks for gathering us once again here in your house in the name of your Son Jesus to worship and praise you. We thank you for the gift of song. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to speak to you through prayer and to listen to your reply, and even more so to open ourselves to your speaking to each one of us through the power of your word both as it is read and proclaimed. Today, Lord God, as in the days of the synagogue, we pray that the words that we have just shared may be joined together with the words that follow to speak that one word to each of us as each may have need to hear it. And so I ask, as always, Lord God, that you would give me the gift of preaching and those here gathered ears to hear it and hearts to make it real. For we ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The story is told about a young man who was a guest preacher and he went uh, and was invited to preach at a small church. And as he got going in a sermon, after a little while, he started noticing the people in the congregation began to cough. And there, first there was a cough from the back over there, and then a cough from over on this side, and one from the middle, and some from the balcony, and then it began to become a cacophony, and you could hear the sounds of the coughing coming from behind him in the choir, up in the loft, out in the pews, and again and again and again as he kept trying to preach through these coughs. And finally he stopped and he said, excuse me for interrupting my message today, he said, but I'm concerned about all of you. You, you sound like you're all suffering from a cold because of all of the coughing, and someone in the back of the room, undistinguishable, Shouted out at the top of his lungs, We're not sick, we're just trying to signal you, you're preaching too long. Can't help him, you're not coming back up here again. How many a preacher will have gotten the signals of people? 
people who are sitting in the pews and they're tapping their watches and looking at them as if they are broken or now the cell phones as if they are watching a sitcom that they downloaded from one of these services like Netflix or Amazon. Others will simply not off and fall asleep. A lot of you do that. That's not because you're bored. It's just because you're too old and you didn't get enough sleep last night. I, I understand that. And there are many sermons that are too long and some that are probably too short. But I suspect that whenever Jesus stepped into the pulpit of a synagogue to read God's word and then to make commentary about it, no one ever complained. It says in the scripture that I just shared a moment ago that every time he spoke in the synagogues, every time he visited the different synagogues throughout the Galilee, people responded very favorably to him. And I'd like to suggest to you today that nowhere else except in his own hometown, in that synagogue, in this particular moment of time, did any congregation ever hear not only the shortest message, but the most powerful message that has ever been preached in all, all of Scripture and in the history of the church ever since. <clears throat> this reading, he said, in this reading today, this has been fulfilled. Imagine that. Imagine thinking about that, the power of what it was that he read in those few short verses. Let me share again what they were. He read this from Hosea. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And all of this, he says, today has been fulfilled in your hearing. The implication of which is that in the person of Jesus, and having read that and made that pro proclamation, that in that moment of time, something fundamentally shifted in the whole of the cosmos. That in that moment, that's Kairos opportunity, this, this marvelous moment of time, everything that the people of God had been struggling with for all of the time that they had lived in that place and every generation that preceded them, now had transformed and changed. Why? Because God had fulfilled the power of the promise that had been made by the prophet Isaiah there in that moment of time through the person of Jesus Christ. Powerful, powerful message. It literally didn't matter the length of what it was that he said. His commentary on the passage that he read. What mattered was the potency of the message that was proclaimed. It was a declaration that whatever oppression, whatever struggle, whatever strife that they had experienced was now going to be lifted. This was going to be the emancipation proclamation that Jesus was offering to them as a person given by God to be the very message of transformation that God had promised through the words of the prophet Isaiah. In other words, what that meant was that all of the things that had bound and captivated those people, those Jews who lived in that day and age of Jesus and everyone who had preceded him were now going to be broken apart, everything destroyed. In other words, they may have been poor in material sense, but they could also be poverty stricken in a spiritual one. That bond, that brokenness, that, 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 that experience of being trapped, if you will, in the circumstances and the situation in which they found themselves was now going to be transformed. The promise was that whatever oppression that they experienced from the Romans and the others who kept their thumb down on their heads was going to ultimately be lifted. The promise was that the religiosity of the day that continued to push their thumb down on their heads with more and more rules and regulations that they could not possibly keep in their minds, let alone practice in their lives, were now not going to be the distinctive thing that controlled them. And they were going to be free from the desire and the need for themselves to be in control of their own lives. Why? Because God was promising them a new break, a new way of living, a way that was focused on the way of Jesus that would be transformative and magnificent and marvelous to, to see. This promise that was made real in Jesus himself 
as he went about the world beginning to preach and to share, began to transform and change individual lives, both in the hearing and also in the proximity of them to him, whatever illness or whatever problem they may have experienced. Every time they encountered Jesus, they left the encounter different, made better, made new. And this was the promise that he said was going to be fulfilled in that day and going forward. It's a remarkable declaration, specifically and especially because of the circumstances in which they found themselves. Poverty of the nation, you know we're well. It was a terrible time to be alive, in a sense. The oppression of the Roman Empire was exceedingly hard and harsh upon those people who lived in that place. They had long ago lost all of the riches that they had ever attained for themselves. They had lost the brightest and best. They had barely just managed to eke out existences in each one of their little <coughs> enclaves where they lived. In every village, in every place, wherever Jesus went, there were men and women, most of them, who were suffering and struggling, impoverished, if you will, not just because of the oppression of the Romans upon them or the religiosity of the religious leaders at the time, but also because the land itself had become barren in so many ways, and it was difficult to make a living, and the taxes were high and hard and harsh on them, and they suffered and they struggled, and there was illness and infirmity of one type or another. And in all of these things, constantly, in all of it, they were yearning and hoping for the day when all of this would change. And in the speaking of those words from Isaiah, and the declaration that it was fulfilled in that day, the beginning of the transformation of the whole of the world had begun. What a remarkable witness to the power of God's love and his expectation for the world. Now you need to understand that in our day and age we have differences. We are in our own particular context much more wealthy and much better off in many ways than those Jews were in their day. We have poverty still, we have blindness, we have afflictions of the skin and of the heart and of the health of men and women all over the place. We have things that cause difficulty and distress. We have enmity from one person to another. We have that sometimes in families between spouses and with children and with grandparents and with neighbors and friends. And we have divisions and hardships and hurt that exist in our communities and in our states and in our nation as a whole. We are a divided nation. We have difficulties and problems getting along with the political differences that we may have. We look at a world in which there is certainly a high percentage of people out there who are seeking to do harm to others who simply are trying to live their lives and their whole purpose is to destroy anyone who seems happy in any way, shape, or form that doesn't, where their happiness doesn't conform with whatever worldview that particular group has in mind at the time. And in all of these things, you and I, as men and women in this world, constantly striving to find ways to be in control of the circumstances we find ourselves in, to grasp hold of these things and to overcome them, to try to be in control of our own destiny and our own lives when making the choices that we make, hoping and believing that if we do, and we do them in concert with others, somehow, miraculously, marvelously, we will be led into a promised land that will be beautiful, lovely, and light. But the reality is, if you really look at your own life and really, really think about it closely and carefully, you'll discover that you're not as in control as you think you really are. None of us are in as much control of our lives as we like. Try as I might, I keep getting older. It's true. I thought when I was a kid that the Peter Pan concept was one of the greatest inventions in the history of humanity. Who doesn't want to be a little boy forever? Who doesn't want to be a little boy forever? Who doesn't want a little boy to be a little boy forever? Every mother and father, right? Am I right about that? Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> yeah, and spouses, wives who marry them and have to raise them from that point forward. Am I right about that? Amen, amen. <coughs> you live in a world in which we want to have things and want to be in control. I have always wanted and, and desired to be in control of my health, thinking that if I just ate the right things and did the right things, okay, not always did I eat the right things and do the right things, but even so, I was under the idea that if I started this new diet or started this new exercise regimen, suddenly I was going to be in control of whatever it is that made my body healthy. 
My body has been afflicted a number of times, as you well know. Your bodies have been afflicted as well. We all suffer this. It's the part and parcel of the process of getting older. The older we get, the harder it is. I was telling the choir in there <coughs> this morning. I was for a time when I was getting dressed. I thought I was having a stroke. It took me ten minutes to tie my bow tie. <laughs> really, ten minutes. Normally it takes me two and a half minutes, and it comes out perfect. This time it took me ten minutes, and it's a skew. <laughs> yeah. I left the house anyway because I was out of control. And then I got here late. And then I looked at my message, which I had looked at and worked at before I left to go visit my mother when Peggy and I went to go see my mom. And I thought, wow, you know, it's, it, it wrote it, it's good, it's great. I left it in the can, I came back, I looked it over last night, I looked it over this morning, and I don't know what happened between last night and this morning, but somebody stole the good sermon I'd written and threw it away. <laughs> so now I'm sitting in here going, this sermon really it's bad. i got to do something about it. And, and I'm still right now, as I'm standing here before you, trying to fix it as I go. <laughs> and the problem with that is because we think we're in control. But we're not. Countless things happen to us, whether we realize it's going to happen or not. We went to visit my mom and see if she was going to be healthy, and, and uh, you know she's had some health issues all the time. We get there, we have a great greeting. The very next day, she wakes up, she gets a bloody nose, and won't stop bleeding. Her blood pressure is 235 over 150. <laughs> we spent the day getting her blood pressure down, stopping the bleeding in her nose. Mostly, it was trying to get her to put her head in the right position and pinch it in the right place, because you know how moms are. They don't listen to you at all. You can't control your mother. <laughs> Day and a half later, she gets in a car accident driving out of a parking lot in a public supermarket. She's not hurt. She's fine. The car is just a little damaged. The poor uh, Chinese fellow who hit her, he's still mumbling in language that none of us can figure out. It's all right. Everything will be fine. But it wasn't, we weren't in control of the day. And we're not in control of whether the weather's going to come and hit us. We're not in control of whether... We're going to have the baby when we really want to have the baby. Hint, hint. <laughs> or whether it's just going to come when it's supposed to come. Because we're not in control. And yet there's so many things that we are in control of. And one of the most significant ones is whether or not we will be faithful to trusting the promise that Jesus made when he made that sermon, statement, that day so long ago in the synagogue back there. That it was fulfilled. It was already done. That nothing you could do in your life is going to wipe away whatever sins you have done. You can't fix it. Only God can do it. And whatever you do in the future as you step forward in faith, you have an option, the choice, the power to decide whether you're going to follow Jesus and trust Him or not. <coughs> Beyond that, you have no control. Where He leads you, you have no control. What he wants you to do when you get there, you have no control. All he asks is that if you give up your control, your life, your soul, your being, your whole uh, sense of self, to him, he will not waste it or squander it on unimportant things. That's a remarkable idea to have in your head, is it not? The notion that if you let go of control and give it to him, he will not squander your life on unimportant things. I don't know about you, but I regularly go through periods of time in which I think about what it is that I want to have the Lord think about me when I meet Him that day when it comes. And I think again and again, I do want Him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But not because of my efforts and accomplishments, but simply because I let go of control and I let him lead me where he wants me to go. And that is my message to you today. The fulfillment of what Jesus said in that synagogue long ago can only come to fruition in your life when you finally understand who's really supposed to be in control of you and your life. And let God do it. Enough said.
Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for taking control of our lives when we give it to you and making something meaningful out of it. In Christ's name we pray.
God and one another through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you, and indeed we do proclaim how great thou art. Father, we acknowledge this morning that you are a holy, righteous, mighty God, and we are humbled that we have the privilege to come before you and share our requests, our hurts, our burdens before you, knowing that you are a God who loves us and hears and answers our prayers. Father, we are so grateful for the way that you show us, moment by moment through each day, your love for us, how you bless us with physical needs that we have, that you provide us an abundance. We are indeed a rich people, and we give you thanks for your blessings. Father, we thank you for this body of Christ that gathers in this sanctuary each week, how you have knit us together as family, where we cry with one another and we rejoice with one another. Father, we know that that's a gift from your hand and we don't take it for granted. We give you praise and thanksgiving for it. Father, there are those in this body of Christ, in this family, who have great needs, whose hearts are hurting from the loss of a loved one, who are worried about financial hardship, who are looking for a job, who have children who are far from you. Father, we bring all of these concerns before you, trusting you. And as Lee said in his message this morning, we are not in control of any of it. Would you help us, O oh God, to give it over to you? We trust you. Would you help us to trust you more? Father, would you give us hearts of compassion for those in our city who have a need, for those in our world? who are far from you, who are suffering hardship, who are living in countries where they fear for their lives. Father, would you keep our hearts tender so that we don't become insulated, that we look beyond ourselves. And Father, for this congregation, would you, as collectively we come before you, would you help us to see the needs that are right in front of us? Would you help us to care for others more than we care for ourselves? We are so blessed, and we are so grateful for your blessings, but most of all, we are so grateful for the gift of Jesus and the salvation that he offers to each of us, because we can't imagine a day without that gift. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we ask now that you would hear the prayer that was taught to your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in our worship, we have the joy to give on to God his tithes and our offerings. 
giving. And our prayer, O oh Lord, is that you would direct us how to use these gifts to spread your gospel in this town and indeed around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Very good. Now, the next order of business is uh, a functional one of the congregation. There are two primary responsibilities that the congregation has uh, in terms of uh, the functioning of the church. One is to organize and call, uh, create uh, search committees for pastors. The second is to nominate uh, individuals to serve as nominating members to the committee that nominates to the body, to the congregation, the names of those who put forward to serve as elders and deacons in the church. It's a very important committee of the church. And so uh, these names have been uh, put forward to you to serve as at-large members of the standing nominating committee. They are Catherine Alleywood, Jim Ellis, and Ed Maudlin, and they serve in rotating classes. Uh, are there any other nominations from the floor? It is your right to do so. Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed by the same sign. The motion carries. I will make sure that all three of them know it was nip and tuck, but eventually they <laughs> were able to succeed. And now on to the other business, the stewardship reports from last year, this year, uh, going forward, and then a uh, report from our missions ministry team. Before I do, I want to tell you a quick story. There's a little story about a small church in which they had an annual meeting like this one, and they were talking about the finances of the church. And after the service was over, after the meeting was over, at the door as the pastor was greeting folks, and one guy came up, and he really was just irate. He said, I was looking through the budget here, and I noticed the church spent five money to buy five brooms. He said, five brooms. I can't believe how unthriftworthy you folks are. And then he walked away. Well, the pastor, <coughs> he was new there, and he was a little bit uh, chagrined by it. So he turned to the uh, treasurer, and he said, uh, you know, Joe over here was really miffed about the fact that we bought five brooms and spent the money that we did on the five brooms. I didn't think there were that much money, but we spent five, you know, bought five brooms. And the treasurer said, oh, don't worry about Joe. I understand why he's upset. He has a right to be. We took all of the money he pledged to the church last year and bought those five brooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, we do not have a congregation that functions that way. I'm proud to tell you, as always, how grateful I am to God for your generosity of spirit to be able to support the ministry of this church. You have done it in the past. You have done it remarkably well in so many different ways. The men and women of this church have committed themselves uh, in this new year to do things even differently, but uh, to really focus your attention on intentional giving. And we are grateful because of the opportunity that that will provide for us to do even more ministry than we have in the past. And so, without any further ado, it is my pleasure uh, to bring up Zoth Potts and uh, John Reppolds to share a little bit about our stewardship. Uh, John first for 2016. John? We'll take a second to let the ushers pass out, pass out the uh, information. <clears throat> As we said, we've done things a little bit differently. I will cover 2016, Zolf will cover 2017, and then Russell will talk about the missions going forward. Um, the chart you have explains our budget in terms of the programs that, we're, that we have, unlike what we've sometimes seen in the past, which was by the commission. This is by the program. And let me cover this in sort of a narrative form. Now, last year, your session made a decision that we would not leave the PCUSA, and as a result, and that, because that would result in bigger issues and more divisive congregation. Lee's illness at the start of the year shocked us all. But through your intercessory prayers and God's will, Lee's come through. His leadership and renewed energy has led us forward, and we as a congregation have accomplished much in 2016. And we will and need to do even more in 2017. In 2016, we paid down the mortgage on the renovation by using almost $44,000 of operating funds. 
out of the budget. And we, that's designated as Friends of Faith on the chart. Additional monies were also given in the names of Friends of Faith itself by you, which helped reduce the principal. When we started 2016, we didn't know if we'd be able to fund the mission commission, their plan. The pledging at the beginning of the year just didn't provide sufficient funds to allow us to budget for our giving to the mission support. However, because of your commitments and the faithfulness of some of our members, we were able to fully support our giving to these groups that carry God's message to the people of this community and beyond. Russell will be, we'll talk more fully about this in, in a minute. But look, I can tell you that I'm involved in several other nonprofits in Washington, that this congregation can hold its head high in meeting God's call. We are among the community's leaders in helping the disadvantaged. Now this facility, this church, Fellowship Hall, and the Education Wing are, well, they're not spring chickens. Old things cost more to maintain. My MRI Friday did that too. <laughs> this past year has seen repairs to the roof, the steeple, the organ chamber, we've installed new rail, railings, and had to deal with carpenter ant infestation that threatened the wooden pipes in the organ. This is an old, memorable, and beautiful facility. But like all, all of us, as we age, it needs tender loving care. Our worship services are now marginally livelier. Oh, I guess we should be honest. Chris has brought us a new energy that not only the choir, but most of you, most importantly, you, the congregation, are enjoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> new choir members, new programs, and a new level of energy have lifted the congregation to a whole new level of worshiping Christ. We thank Chris for his expansion of this ministry with the handbell choir and the children's choir. But we all know this comes with an additional cost that I think we joyfully accept. And what can we say about children's youth and family ministries? Brittany brought a renewed interest by, by families to First Presbyterian Church. For those of you that were around 13 years ago, you remember the youthful enthusiasm that we experienced. <coughs> the services were sometimes led by the youth. Brittany's bringing that back. You, you saw it from just in the number of kids we have here this morning. In the pastor, stewardship, and administration numbers, you see the salaries of Lee and the administrative staff, plus the cost of operating this facility, the insurance, electric, telephone, and other operational expenses. They're necessary to any organization. Our future, our call, is to move out into the community and spread God's word of salvation and redemption. Our job is not to serve ourselves, although that is both necessary and valuable. Our job is to serve the least amongst us. We will accomplish this through the bold, new vision for 2017. And I ask you to come forward to study that too. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. John, you, you told a good thing. You told me anything you could talk about. Thank you. I'm just kidding. But uh, I do want to thank John for his contribution to our church uh, in his leadership role with the Stewardship Commission over the last several years as chairman. Uh, he's led us through some uh, times that were somewhat difficult. And uh, he's going to remain on the board, I assure you, because I, I certainly need his help. John also is very active in the community. He, he is the secretary, I think it is, of the Ruth's House. He's the secretary of the New Women's Shelter Program. And he's involved in a host of other things in the community, as a lot of you are. And I think uh, that speaks very highly about what we're trying to do here at First Presbyterian Church. And 
uh, there, there's so many things left to be done and so many exciting things ahead of us that we all need to pull together to accomplish in 2017. And as John said, it was so wonderful to have Lee back in our fold, standing up here and keeping us awake and alert and moving forward. And cracking the whip, which he does very well. <laughs> welcome, welcome back. And, and it's good to have you. <coughs> there, Pat, did you pass out the 2017? Uh, your session has approved an aggressive uh, budget for uh, 2017 and projects an anticipated surplus. And the key thing, it reaches out to others. We're not all using it just on ourselves. We're putting it against those things that really matter. You might be interested to know that in our last uh, stewardship campaign, over 100 individuals returned their pledge cards, if you can call them pledge cards, it was an indication that they are striving to reach a tithing situation. Uh, and as long as we're striving to do something, we're well on our way. And, and, and I, I don't know, I said I, over 100 uh, have, have replied that they're, they're in that situation. Now, let's look at what's coming up for 2017, even though we are a little down the road again. If you look at the uh, Faith Counts uh, page, uh, this was mailed out to you by Lee uh, earlier, earlier this year. And I just want to go over briefly the, the categories. And what it's doing, what, what he has done is he's putting uh, the, uh, the money against the specific programs uh, that, that kind of join together to, to provide what we have here. Worship and music. You know, you stop thinking about that, and what, what more fun can you have than, than to come here and praise God and sing hymns? It's, it's just a great, great situation. Eleanor Robbins heads up our worship commission and does a grand job, and I guarantee things are in order with that commission. And I think you will agree we have a tremendous music program in our church, as was indicated earlier. And we've got the best choir in both the county. <laughs> but they do a super job, and, and we thank them for their dedication and coming out every week and practicing and providing wonderful music to us. And so, in that category, uh, $63,318 is being allocated to the worship and music category. And as part of that situation, we are looking forward to uh, potentially a uh, early bird contemporary worship service uh, to, to offer uh, opportunities to those people who enjoy that type of uh, situation and like to get up early. And some of us are like to sleep a little later, so I'm going to start to continue what we're doing. But that's just an opportunity that we see that we can reach more people. Uh, uh, and, and provide uh, all of the wonderful things that we are getting in this service. <coughs> Buildings and grounds, as as John mentioned, uh, this is an older building. Uh, the other buildings are not not brand new either. Uh, but we've got a young man handling our uh, buildings and grounds. Darius Bradshaw does a wonderful job. <laughs> And his team works hard. And it's not easy to keep our roof from leaking and keeping our organ happy so that it plays the way it should. And it's taken quite a bit of money over the past year to do that. And we projected uh, this year to, uh, to allocate $50,000 to that situation. We certainly want to do everything we can to keep our organ uh, sounding well. Uh, it means a lot to all of us. We're, we're fortunate to have it. And it adds so much to, uh, to our worship service. The next one is uh, children, youth, and family services. Uh, and he talked about that. Uh, 
have Brittany and her program uh, in that category of uh, 60,531 has been allocated uh, to that. Christian education, Alita <coughs> Sawyer uh, heads up our great <coughs> Christian education program, and Stuart Thompson handles our membership commission. And, and you've been adding new members to it, and you're doing something right, so keep doing it. Keep, 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 uh, keep bringing them in the door. And it's great having folks who have joined us recently. And then the Frames of, uh, Frames of Faith program, uh, your session has elected to proceed with retiring that debt as soon as the requests and gifts are available that we anticipate coming in very soon. And with that, uh, it's about $215,000 remaining to be paid on the mortgage to First Citizens Bank. And uh, even though the interest rate is not sky high, as we know, I think we're paying about three and a half, three and three quarters percent. Uh, there, there are several factors that, that sort of indicate we should maybe go ahead and do that. One of which is we have to pay uh, for flood insurance at this church because we are finance, we, of the financing we have that is, is, is required uh, when, you, when you have that balloon. Uh, the church has never flooded to our knowledge, and uh, hopefully will not uh, in the future. And we're paying about 4000 a year for flood insurance that we really don't need. So by going ahead and retiring that debt, uh, it allows us to save that $4,000 and apply it to something else that uh, just should be more meaningful to us as a church. Missions and evangelism, uh, excuse me, uh, the, the frame, I did say 215,000 paying out all. Uh, missions and evangelism, you know, this is really one of the most important things that we can do as Christians to help those in need. And we're fortunate that we've got a, a, a head of our missions commission, Russell Thanpont, that has a passion for missions. And he, he, in the past years, Russell has been around a long time, not as long as some of us, but he's been around a long time, and has always been active in missions. And we're very fortunate to have him hitting that up this year. But we've increased the missions budget to $73,829. Last year it was below $50,000. And uh, in the missions uh, budget this year, we have allocated twenty thousand dollars to towards the assistance of the women's and children's shelter possibility. And this is something that uh, we have taken on uh, as a church, as again John has mentioned, and we are sort of the lead entity in moving forward with that. Uh, and. So our members are very active on the board that is putting all this together. Doc Mode is chairman. There's Doc. And she is on a lot of worthwhile things, Doc. Thank you all you do. Marsha Norwood uh, is on the board. And John Reynolds, of course, is on the board. And we do have Methodist Christians and Episcopalians in the boat. And so they're going to make sure they come to the table bearing gifts also. Uh, but the groundwork is being laid at this time for the ch uh, children's, women's and children's uh, shelter. And uh, you just don't go out and buy a house and say, okay, y'all come in. Yeah. It, there's a lot involved with this and uh, all sorts of, of situations. One, what they're doing now is they're trying to uh, organize to the point where uh, they can attain a 5013C designation uh, so that when you contribute to it, uh, you can deduct it as a as, uh, expense, uh, as a gift. And also, we're looking for a suitable site for the uh, for, for the facility. You know, again, you stop to think about it, uh, what would be a, a perfect situation. Uh, it's not probably not out there, but there's some some possibilities that are being looked at. So all of this is kind of going on at this time. And Russell and Doc and all the others involved will be bringing you up to date as this progresses. It's hard to believe that there are, there are women who have children who have no place to sleep at night and in some cases are being taken to shelters in Greenville and Newport because we don't have them here in the county. Something's wrong with that and we need to do something about it. 
Uh, okay, so uh, also in the missions, and quick switch, I won't spend any more time because uh, Russ is going into that. Uh, we do a lot of things for a lot of people. Uh, <clears throat> anytime that you have something that you feel that our church should be involved in from a mission standpoint, please bring it up. Because your, your commission doesn't always know exactly everything that we should be doing, obviously. Feel free to contact Russell uh, uh, or Marshall Mowood, who's also on the commission. And matter of fact, we've got a large number and uh, we've got some more folks coming on board. Uh, but there are some things that uh, maybe have not been continued that need to be continued. But speak up and, and let them know about it. I mean, don't get mad and leave. <laughs> Come and say, we need to do this. You know. Okay, so uh, the final one is pastor, stewardship, administration, and support staff. I think uh, John indicated you exactly what, what was involved in that. And in, in the stewardship commission, you see uh, all the money allocated, and, and of course, uh, most of that is is uh, is the uh, is the frames of faith pay, paying paying that situation off. Uh, on, on, I, I do want to say on the Stewardship Commission, we've got a stellar staff that you need to know about so that you know your money is being uh, considered very wisely. Uh, Tommy Swanner is, is, is on the uh, commission and has been on it for a long time. He's also out of church treasurer. Chuck Bradford, who's been chairman of it for a number of years, uh, is also on our commission. Kelly Crisp and John Rebels, our outgoing chairman, is going to remain on it, as I said before. So your funds are watched closely, and our investments are watched closely, I can assure you. <clears throat> this year, uh, our staff uh, is are receiving an increase in their salary of 1.5%, uh, which is the cost of living category. Uh, one and a half is not much, but it does show that we're trying to do what we can with the assets that we have. Uh, our pastor has asked us not to provide that adjustment to him, and he does not want to take an additional increase at this time and in the future. Uh, he feels he is well compensated, and he's happy, and he wants to provide us these funds that possibly would be used for this situation to go into the uh, missions commission and particularly toward the people in need fund, which is used for people who have needs immediately and need money now. So uh, it's a wonderful thing and we can thank you for that. And the, the other commission that we have, uh, they really didn't have a, any money allocated to it. It doesn't mean we don't love it and, and it's not important. It's, uh, the Planning Commission. Ron Seekers heads that up. And that, I, I think, Will, you, you've been on the Planning Commission. Uh, because we don't have money allocated for it, for it, that means that it's not an important entity uh, of our church. Now, if you will turn your page over and look at the blue chart, it looks like similar, very similar to what John talked about for 2016. <coughs> And what it's done is just allocating exactly what we just talked about uh, in, in the narrative form to, uh, to the various categories, uh, showing the expenses up and, and, and the total expenses uh, for 2017 are projected to be uh, $760,390. Actually, the last one, which says miscellaneous, uh, could be considered service because it had been allocated. Uh, and that's uh, that's kind of the way it shows up on our uh, big uh, profit and loss state or operating state. If you look over on the right hand side, you see the revenues. Um, thankfully, we've come out to, to the same situation. And, and, and we're, we're dealing on a phase situation here, and we're all kind of responsible to see that that, that happens. Faith giving. <coughs> Is, is the big category, and that's generally all that, that we do, and what we feel that we should be giving. The unrestricted uh, bequests and gifts, 
as you can see, 282, and then the two smaller situations there come up to the 763 night. Uh, as, as I think John mentioned last year, uh, we had a surplus at the end of the year. We had more income than we anticipated, and we had uh, less expenses than we anticipated. And we hope, we're hopeful that this year will be, be similar to that. And then the other page that you have there is, uh, is a more traditional breakdown of the budget uh, situation showing the income and the expenses. And that's the way it's kind of lines up on, on the big, big uh, uh, budget. Uh, if you have any questions with any of these things, uh, feel free to ask me or John or anyone on the commission that I mentioned to you earlier or give us a call or whatever. Uh, you, you're welcome to come to the Stewardship Commission meeting at any time. We'd love to have you. We meet uh, on the what is it? second Thursday of each month at 4 o'clock here at the church. And we'd love to have you come and sit in if you'd you, you like to. And also, if, if you want more, more information than we talked about today, uh, you could, you're welcome to get a, a copy of the full budget in the church office if, if that's something that you'd like to do. Okay? Now, let me talk just a minute about time and talent. You remember, you probably all received in the mail uh, a time and talent sheet asking you to indicate the areas that you have an interest in, uh, that you have an expertise in, uh, or you have a willingness in participating in. And so those uh, time and talent sheets have been taken back and collated and allocated to the areas where you have indicated an interest and have been given to the uh, leaders of the session, the commission leaders of the session, to contact you and get you involved. That's what it's all about, is we all need to be involved. And this is, this is what we're trying, trying to do with the time and talent situation. <coughs> and if you don't hear from anybody within the next two weeks, please call and, 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 and let us know so we can get you involved. And, and, and not just sit there with all the abilities that you have and you're not putting to use. We need you active, helping. It is, it is our hope that every single one of us gets plugged into our church in the areas that you, where you have expertise and or passion and willingness to help. And that should be every single one of us. Together, we all can accomplish great things. Uh, individually, we're sort of limited. So we're, we're really a team in a way. And we've got to pull together and work together. And because the demands and, and the opportunities are so great out there for us. And we're so well positioned at this time to make a difference. And, and we have made a lot of progress over the years. And uh, it was interesting, it was brought to my attention uh, when someone gave me a copy of the church bulletin from 1960, just a few years ago. 57 years ago. <laughs> and I remember it. <laughs> I, know, I know everybody on it. <laughs> but uh, we have made history in looking at the back of this bulletin. Uh, in 1960, the session had 12 members, and they all were men, good men, knowledgeable, good men, rocks, one of them. On the diagonal, we had 15 members. Guess what? All men, good men, loyal Presbyterians. The only thing that I see on the back of the directory is listing names uh, where women were involved or with, is in women of the church. There are seven women listed as officers of women of the church. And that was 1960. And I, I say that, it's just a few years ago, but it's a lot longer. Guess what? 
we've made history. We now have 12 members on our session. 50% of the members on our session are women and 50% are men. And I believe that's the first, is it not? It is. So we are making progress. So y'all hang in there with us. <laughs> thank you for your time and thank you for all you're doing for First Presbyterian Church. And I'm going to call on my good friend, Mr. Thiemont, to go into missions. And Russell, they like hungry, so don't go too long. <laughs> Fortunately, he wasn't the only one that had somebody steal his great uh, speech, speech for today or sermon or whatever. Uh, mine disappeared too somewhere during the service. So I'm just going to make it quick and wing it. Hope that God uh, puts the words that he wants here. Uh, this September will be the 21st anniversary of me giving a minute for mission from this pulpit. That first minute for mission was a report on our first trip to Haiti, mission trip to Haiti. That, that trip was a direct result of the session at that time taking an act of faith to pledge $50,000 over three years to Presbyterian missions. If you look heard just a minute ago, this year we are committing $73,000 towards mission. We've come a long way. Uh, we've made great progress. The act of faith 20 some odd years ago has led this congregation to be the mission church in Washington, North Carolina. We missions we have supported, the projects we have completed, are long and numbered and, and great. And I'm going to take this time right now to do a month-by-month -month review of the last 21 years. <laughs> I'm going to get this lunch on Wednesday night. <laughs> Your current session has, has taken a, another act of faith. It has uh, proposed a new bold action. There's a banner in the fellowship hall that lists seven projects that we are undertaking, all at once. Uh, from the women's shelter to uh, a new worship service. I can't remember all seven. I didn't even write those down. Uh, it's in response to Christ's Instructions for his church, for us, his people. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. To go out into the world and make Christians of all nations. And to tend his flock. Lord, when did I see you hungry, cold, alone, and tired? This initiative is set out to meet those. But we can't do it with money alone. It'll take all of us. Look at that banner. See what it says. See, ask yourself, what can I do to move that forward? How can I help? God has no hands but ours to do his work. Thank you. Before we adjourn, Two uh, real quick, simple things to share you. Each year at the uh, annual meeting of the congregation, it, uh, responsible, uh, the responsibility of the congregation uh, to review the terms of call for the pastor, the uh, uh, details of which uh, didn't get printed for some reason. They were supposed to go on the back of the agenda. I apologize uh, for that. We will put them in the bulletin next week. Uh, that is a publishable thing of the details of why in terms of call that includes the medical pension and that sort of thing. One of my basic packages, it's $128,000 total, including uh, that. I get uh, thanks to your generosity and have uh, the entirety of my, most of my ministry. Uh, seven weeks uh, off uh, for continuing education, vacation, uh, learning, writing, and that sort of a thing. And I'm grateful to you for your continued support. Last year you gave me a 3% cost of living adjustment. I hadn't had one for a couple of years. I wasn't here. I appreciate you doing that, but I have, as Zoe said, asked uh, that uh, from this point forward, 
in the no future for the remainder of my active ministry, I see no need uh, for any future increases and that that money instead be dedicated to people in need fund or something like that. The last thing uh, I wanted to share with you that's of importance, you will note in the 2017 uh, budget uh, frames of faith payment of 200 and uh, how much is it? $215,000 that we are uh, going to pay. We promised that we would pay it but by the end of the first quarter. I am pleased to tell you that uh, uh, as of this morning, I received a check uh, from the Don Williams estate in the amount of $308,427.66, which is almost $100,000, a little, little short of $100,000 more than we had anticipated when we made up the budget. And we will be able to deposit that tomorrow and pay off the frames of faith completely uh, by the 1st of February instead of the end of the uh, quarter. And uh, that is because of the generosity of that man and so many others of you who have committed yourself uh, to support that program. 11 years ago, or was it four years ago, when we started this project, people said we couldn't do it. Guess what? We did. We did it because of the faithfulness, not just of people like Don, but of every member of the church who committed everything from $100 to $1,000 to $5,000 and up in order to make this a reality. It is a blessing to have a congregation that has a heart that deep, that strong, and that faithful. And so I encourage you to know uh, that, uh, like Don, uh, I encourage you, as I encouraged him and others who have contributed to the church, to consider the church in your wills uh, and in other instruments of giving uh, so that you can continue your commitment to the congregation even when you're physically not here. The church triumphant exists always and in every time and in every space. And we give thanks to God for every single one of the men and women of this church over time who have contributed to make the financial situation that we are blessed to have today and going forward. And so I think it is incumbent upon all of us to give God thanks and each other thanks for working together uh, to make this a, such a positive, positive year last year and a positive year going forward. Would you put your hands together? <laughs> Lastly, I'm going to ask uh, Bev to come up and give us instructions on what to do for food. The most important part of the Sorry, I forgot to do this at the beginning of the service, but it asked me to let you know that for lunch you can go through the parlor or you can go out the main doors and go through the courtyard. Uh, either door will be fine. The tables are set with plates and bowls, so he asked that you go and get your seat, get your plate and your bowl, and then go in the serving line for soup and sandwich. Thank you. Now we will entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Doesn't need to. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed by the same sign. Everybody who's hungry, please rise. I invite you to join hands with those with whom you've been worshiping that you may receive a charge and a blessing today. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the wonders generosity of spirit that you have provided to the men and women of this church. We pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless us, open our hearts to the opportunities that we have to further your ministry and your kingdom in this place in which we are blessed to live. Help us, Lord God, always to be mindful of those most in need and give us always the wisdom to trust and believe in you above all things, for we know with your help all things are possible. And so, Lord God, bless this food that we are about to eat to its intended purpose to strengthen us in our bodies and our minds that we may do the work that you have put before us to do. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.